We think many of your dragon legends could actually be stories about what we today call dinosaurs. People would say that the dragon legends of old are obviously not true, but it's only obvious because of their preconception that dinosaurs died out so long ago. But when you have this, this universal theme right across the globe, many different continents, many different cultures, and over a, a vast span of human history, then there's probably going to have to be some universal core truth there. Dinosaurs are probably used more than anything to convince people of millions of years. I mean, even little kids all know about dinosaurs. Just to say the word dinosaurs and see what they say next. They probably would say evolution. <laughs> Those two concepts are inextricably linked. The most common objections they encounter is that the Bible can't be true because science has disproved it. You ask them what that means, they mean evolution millions of years. If the soft tissue means what it apparently means, and that is the dinosaurs were around recently. There was no dinosaur age, where only dinosaurs lived, and it was millions of years ago. Once you topple millions of years, you have no time for evolution. The more you study about dinosaurs, they really fit with creation. And, and the evidence seems to go with humans encountering dinosaurs, and not very long ago. Creatures like this were supposed to be separated by mankind for 65 to 70 million years. Yet, here we have respectable people writing in their history books, this is what I've seen, this is what I've witnessed. You know someone's gonna say something. Like what? Got something against Danny? Oh, don't play dumb. You know what I mean. <laughs> Still gonna read it. It's on you then. Nothing to do with me. Fine. Okay, kids, come on over. Gather round. We're gonna have story time. Come on. Find a seat on the carpet. Can everybody see? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, guys, today's story is called Danny the Dragon. Um. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Please note that the opinions expressed during the story time are those of the author and do not necessarily represent those of the Monroe Library or its staff. Thanks, Tony. Would you like me to have them sign release forms? <laughs> Once upon a time, not too long ago, there was a dragon named Danny. He lived in a deep, isolated cave along an ocean coast. One day, he wandered out of the water and saw some houses and people. Curious, he lumbered closer for a better look. Dragons, just the word conjures up all these images and, and people's attention goes right to the, uh, that, uh, the dragons. People want to know about dragons. Dragon legend is absolutely a phenomenon. Um, there are literally too many legends to count. They're in every tribe and nation, every people group. And uh, you have them in China, Australia, Africa, Europe, North America, and South America, everywhere people inhabit. Dragons are really interesting creatures. I think there's not a child with soul so dead that he hasn't become fascinated by dragon stories and dragon legends. And, and the thing that's always struck me as amazing is that it's not, a, it's not a regional legend. It's not a legend of the Chinese, but nobody else or a legend of the Europeans and nobody else. It's everybody's legend. Now, a legend is, of course, a, a legend. It's a fairy tale. But is there, in fact, most anthropologists will tell you that whenever you have a legend or mythology, that there's usually something that happened that started that myth. So the point is there, there is a, some consistent threads in these different cultures, South Sea Island, South Pacific, you know, American Indians, and so forth. So uh, when you find uh, the similar kinds of legends that suggest that either a common legend uh, exchange or those legends deriving from some kind of historical antecedent. If we we're to believe that they're mythological that really presents a logical problem for us because there is a consistency that happens throughout all the dragon legends. Of course dragon legends can become sensational you know a lot of your pagan religions attach some sort of meaning to these things like a, a lot of times in Chinese mythology a dragon would you know be responsible for the tides or uh, or it would control the water or something like that but if you scrape away all the sensationalism you actually have a very real creature at the bottom of them that is consistent throughout all 
really in the entire world, you just have a large scaled reptile that has uh, many of them fly, some of them don't, but the ones that do fly have wings like a bat and uh, they're carnivorous and they're basically going to gnaw your face off. And it is consistent no matter where you go. Um, and that truly is remarkable. They look like big reptiles with long tails with scales uh, with uh, sharp teeth, uh, claws, oftentimes three claws, by the way, uh, which many of the dinosaurs did have three claws, like the theropods. So I believe they're what many people uh, have uh, called dragons or have been translated to the word dragon, uh, uh, really reflect a, a human experience widespread among almost all cultures of having witnessed at some point in history very, very large, very frightening reptiles. You know, the, the dragon legends, uh, the, the stories of these dragons, they always talk about these huge reptilian beasts with fierce teeth and, and prickly spines, and, and they just sound so much like dinosaurs. It's like um, knowing about Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, we have to rely on, on historical records of these things, because you can't scientifically prove that Julius Caesar existed. It's always a matter of history. And I think dragons a lot of that will be um, um, widespread historical writings of such creatures, including, for instance, the Chinese calendar, where you have 12 um, animals. Uh, one of them is a dragon. I'm, I'm, I was born in the year of a dragon. But all the animals are treated e as equally real. So it does seem like the Chinese people did see a creature we would now call a dragon, which they called the long Actually, there are a lot of legends of dragons being used for breeding. The Chinese have stories about breeding dragons. Um, there are artifacts that show um, people riding these things. It's quite remarkable that, uh, to, to many people, that Australian Aboriginal people actually have uh, accounts of their ancestors having encountered creatures that today, by any reckoning, you'd describe as being dinosaurs on the basis of scientist reconstructions from fossils. Uh, on a personal level, I recall meeting a, a university researcher in the Northern Territory in Darwin after giving a, a presentation there a couple of years ago. And she said that she'd been working with the local Larrakia Aboriginal people. And they, um, had a word for a fierce creature that lived in the local swamps there that used to terrorise uh, the um, first Aboriginal people who'd come to that area via canoes from another country far away. And when this university researcher said to them, oh, that word obviously means crocodile, the Larrakia people responded, no, we've got a different word for crocodile. Uh, this other creature, in fact, looks very similar to some of your dinosaurs in your children's book about dinosaurs. There is an Indian legend called the Thunderbirds. And according to legend, these huge bird-like creatures would fly and they would actually be able to bring thunder with them. And at first, that seemed sensational. But if you start looking at the evidence, things change just a little bit. Because what is in the Black Hills in South Dakota, the, the legend is that these, these, these giant thunderbirds would actually fly to the top of the Black Hills and they would like nest there. Now what is fascinating is that scientists have long believed that those kind of um, gigantic creatures needed strong winds to propel them to high heights. And so in the west where you have these gigantic thunderstorms, it is really postulated that these, these gigantic um, pteranodons would catch thermal updrafts of these storms that would lift them to the top of places like the Black Hills. So from a, an Indian's perspective that is trying to, to um, pull meaning from the things in nature, they would look at these, uh, what they would call thunder burdens, go, wow, they are bringing thunder. But it's actually, uh, what's really happening is that it's the thunderstorms that are actually bringing the pteranodons. This is taken from a book named After the Flood where he recounts, Dinosaurs in the form of flying reptiles were a feature of Welsh life until surprisingly recent times. As late as the beginning of the present century, elderly folk at Penlyn in Glamorgan used to tell of a colony of winged serpents that lived in the woods around Penlyn Castle. As Mary Trevelyan tells us, the woods around Penlyn Castle, Glamorgan, had the reputation of being frequented by winged serpents. And these were the terror of old and young alike. An aged inhabitant of Penlin, who died a few years ago, said that in his boyhood, the winged serpents were described as very beautiful. 
He said it was no old story invented to frighten children, but a real fact. His father and uncle had killed some of them, for they were as bad as foxes for poultry. The old man attributed the extinction of the winged serpents to the fact that they were terrors in the farmyards and coverts. This is a pteranodon, an example of one. And by the way, not all of them were huge with big long wings. And in Beowulf, it describes two different kinds. One which had massive huge wings, which we know existed from fossils, 30 foot and more wingspan. But there's another kind of winged serpent that was smaller, but it was just as much a pest, not just in Beowulf, but in England and to the North American Indians and Central American Indians, etc. Interesting, the, there's a Scandinavian king called Beowulf, and there's a very famous poem about his exploits. And if you read about his description of this big beast that he, he killed because it was terrorizing the villagers, it's a very accurate description of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Most people say Beowulf is entirely mythical because there's all these monsters in it. But if you read Beowulf, the poem, it doesn't say fairies and magic elves. It's talking about the Grendel. It's talking about a bipedal monster with giant mouth and big teeth that ate people, just like we might imagine a pteropod dinosaur might do. In the Agat National Park in Nebraska, there are these structures in the side of the rocks called Devil's Corkscrews. And for years, scientists thought that the plants or some sort of plant created these spiral structures that descend from the surface down about six feet. Um, but it was not until they started excavating them that they found these little fossils of beavers at the bottom of them. And they found out that these beavers made these wild corkscrew lodges um, in the rock. and. Uh, Evolutionary timelines would put this beaver to be extinct about 30 million years ago. But the problem with that is that uh, American Indians know full well what those corkscrews were. And if you would have asked a Lakota Indian, they would have told you they were beaver lodges. My point with Haas Eagle is the Maoris tell a legend about a giant eagle. And it's easy for us to say, oh, giant eagle, pfft, whatever. But it's been verified and it's published. It's the real deal. It was a giant eagle. So if they were right about the giant eagle, then perhaps peoples have been telling the truth in their legends of other creatures too. Most people today accept that dinosaurs have become extinct and even uh, creationists who uh, look at the accounts of uh, apparent recent human uh, dinosaurial contact would say, look, it does seem that dinosaurs are extinct. However, there are some tantalizing accounts of sightings in very recent decades from various places around the world. Uh, in the Congo, for example, the local people there talk of a creature they call Mokele Mbembe. And when uh, Westerners have gone in with drawings of African creatures and dinosaur handbooks, uh, and they've pointed to pictures of, say, the hippopotamus or the rhino. The people have said, no, that's not Makele Mbembe. And when shown a picture of a sauropod dinosaur, in a dinosaur handbook, they've pointed to something like a small sauropod dinosaur. Uh, another example comes to mind, the Lake Murray region of Papua New Guinea. Uh, there were people there out in a canoe, and as they looked under their canoe, they saw a large creature swim under the canoe that had what looked like triangular plates extending down its back and all the way down its long tail. And the people speak there of uh, large nesting sites um, adjacent to the water's edge, uh, which have been clearly left by a large creature. If you only had one or two stories uh, that sounded a bit similar to dinosaurs, you could see it as uh, just a coincidence. But when you have this, this universal theme right across the globe, many different continents, many different cultures, and over a vast span of human history, then there's probably going to have to be some universal core truth there. In fact, the late Dr. Carl Sagan, one of the most well-known of all the world's evolutionists, took it so seriously that he actually wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden. to. to try and answer this question as to how come there are so many different stories of dragons that are very similar to the dinosaurs when no one's ever seen a dinosaur. And the answer he came up with in his book was essentially that, um, well, we evolved from reptiles, so part of our brain is, is a sort of a leftover of when we lived in the age of the reptiles, and so dragon legends are really, if you like, inherited memories from the age of reptiles. 
Now, there was an embarrassed silence from many of his evolutionary colleagues because, of course, there's uh, no scientific credibility to the idea that memories are inherited. You know, that you might r remember what some ancestor did when he was serving Cleopatra or something like that. Uh, but the importance of that little account was that one of the world's leading evolutionists took this issue so seriously that he tried to explain it, even though he didn't do a very good job. A much better explanation is that the Bible is right, that man and dinosaur did live together, and what we see are the somewhat corrupted legends, um, somewhat corrupted stories of a time when people and dinosaurs did really know each other. Some people saw Danny coming. He was huge with scales and a long tail. They ran away screaming, Dragon, dragon, run for your lives! Danny yelled, Come back! But it just sounded like, Roar! This made everyone run faster. Stories about Danny's huge teeth and claws soon spread across the land. If these really are stories based on memory, that means that at one point in time, man did see dinosaurs. In National Bridges National Monument, Utah, there's actually some carvings, petroglyphs, done by the Indians that even an evolutionist in an evolutionary textbook says looks like a sauropod dinosaur. And we've actually had a team go out there, they've seen it, photographed it, uh, did a wax cloth impression of it, and it just looks like a sauropod dinosaur. But of course the evolutionists would say, well no, it must be some mythical animal, why? Because dinosaurs didn't live with people. Well, how do you know that? And, and so to me, that sort of evidence, when you look at your dragon legends, many of the descriptions of those dragons actually fit nicely what we would call dinosaurs. And many of your dragon carvings, for instance, uh, that you see dragon paintings around the world, they look like some of the dinosaurs that we would understand existed from the fossil record. The exact date was 1186 AD. And it's a stone temple that's in the Angkor Wat temple complex around Cambodia. and. Uh, in a jungle area. There's a number of stone carvings of uh, things that are familiar to us today along with Hindu and Buddhist mythology and very distinctively there's one that looks very much like a stegosaur as, uh, as reconstructed from fossils by scientists and the question becomes how did the people who carved that stone 800 years ago have carved so beautifully uh, a stegosaur without having um, had any knowledge about what's in today's encyclopedias? And the clear conclusion is they were familiar with those creatures because they were alive at the same time. Unless it was living, how could they get its anatomy correct? They had to see it in order to reproduce it correctly and that's just one of over 80 instances around the world in every single continent where it's been found that humans and dinosaurs have coexisted because the humans have reproduced dinosaurs in one art form or another. There's a cathedral in the UK, Carlisle Cathedral, uh, which has been there a very long time and one of the bishops buried there uh, 600 years ago has uh, on the brass trimmings around his tomb a number of uh, engravings of animals many of which are familiar to us today but there's also some that look very much like sauropod dinosaurs in fact any 21st century child would immediately recognize them as being sauropod dinosaurs and so when we think about the evolutionary view that says dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, and then we look at these sauropod dinosaur engravings on this 600-year-old tomb, how did they get there? The oldest artifact that we have, period, is an Egyptian slate that commemorates uh, an Egyptian king. And Hierakonpolis slate is one of the names given to this artifact. And on one side it shows him grasping the head of his recently defeated foe and about to chop the head off. So it's, it's a slate saying, look how great I am. And on the back, it's got some Egyptians with ropes around necks of two great sauropod looking, I mean, they look just like a children's book with a, a patasaurus on it or something, necks intertwined. And we have this motif repeated on two different, totally different places, separated by hundreds of years. Obviously, if there are engravings of sauropod dinosaurs which are hundreds of years old, uh, prior to any scientist reconstructions of fossils, the only way that we could say 
that they could have done it so uh, intelligently was if they had viewed the creatures for themselves or at least had access to sketches or drawings or descriptions made by eyewitnesses of those creatures at around that time. As some people look at the fossil record, as some people look at evidence that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, they see uh, pictures, they see drawings, they see carvings, they see uh, work in metal and weaving of uh, individuals that have actually reproduced dinosaurs. And the American Indian is uh, one of those uh, uh, groups that has done that, especially in uh, paintings and, um, and drawings. Adrian Mayer, first of all, if we talk about what she's done on this, I think we ought to give her credit for doing a tremendous amount of research. And when I say data, I mean legend after legend after legend after legend of descriptions of the same kinds of creatures that were giant, terrible lizards. Um, there were thunderbirds. There were um, water monsters given the same description from tribe after tribe after tribe across North America, but even in South America and Central America. We've got this robust legendary lore, complete with descriptions of habitat, descriptions of habit, anatomical attributes. Where did all this come from? And some people say, well, we don't want to have the Indian living at the dinosaur, so the, uh, the uh, Indian went ahead and found bones, and then went ahead and assembled those bones into uh, the proper shape, and then put the musculature and the skin on the bones, and then based upon what they came up with, they then did a drawing showing what this dinosaur or uh, reptile would look like in life. Now, with all due respect, to the, the skills of the American Indian, and there are a great many of them, I honestly don't know if paleontology uh, hundreds of years ago was one of them. Well, the very fact that we have these artifacts begs the question, how did they know to draw these? In other words, if they're mythological, how, did, how is it that they all drew the same exact myth, <laughs> and yet they're separated through distant time as well as distant geography? And the question, it's a tough one to answer because it depends on your worldview. And if you back up and think, if I just go based on the data, then it seems to suggest on its surface that these people, real life people at some point, encountered creatures that looked like this. I've been informed that in a cave in France, there's a mammoth seemingly engaged with or in combat with a dinosaur. Now, if that's so, that's very significant because even though mammoths are extinct, everybody accepts that mammoths and humans live together because you sometimes find spear points of uh, uh, human spears in mammoth fossils or mammoth skeletal remains in caves um, and of course there are many drawings of mammoths by people and everybody agrees they're mammoths so um, if mammoths and humans are together and you see a picture of a mammoth and a dinosaur together then obviously dinosaurs and humans were together too which, of course, evolutionists say is impossible. American Indians had this legend. They called this creature the grandfather of the buffalo. And, uh, you know, that is that's an interesting description because you're like, okay, uh, what would a grandfather buffalo look like? Obviously, it would have long hair. It would look like a buffalo, but they said it was much, much, much bigger. Well, there was a waterfall found in Minneapolis, and um, underneath this waterfall was this uh, tusks of a mammoth. And Indians actually pointed to that spot and said that's where the grandfather of the buffalo lived. And what's fascinating is if they were able to understand the flesh, they were understand the hairy characteristics of this mammoth, there's only one way they could have known that is if they would have actually seen the creature. And once again we see that the evolutionary time frame, that the layers in the rocks represent millions of years, comes to grief on things like this, which uh, show that people dinosaurs and mammoths and many creatures that we're familiar with today all lived at the same time. First of all, what we have to understand now was not until the year 1822 when Gideon Mantle and his wife found the iguanodon tooth. And that was supposedly the absolute beginning of our understanding of uh, dinosaurs. And it be modern academia will tell you that is when we discovered them. Well, the problem with that is, is that we have all these images of ancient people groups that had intimate knowledge of dinosaurs they drew them on vases they were on pottery and um, if and if it is true that they had no knowledge of dinosaurs and where in the world did all those images come from the people went to the police and demanded that something be done 
the police gathered their weapons and their bravest officers and went off to see what they could find. Danny was terrified. He just wanted to find a friend. He was very old and had looked everywhere but couldn't find anyone else like him. It was like he was the last dragon on earth. You know, it's funny how historians treat ancient history. Because we've got a lot of ancient historians writing things that we take today as matter of fact. Like, you know, this event happened, okay. But then when they start talking about some other things that they believed were true, historians will just discount it. Like, you know, Marco Polo's writing about dragons. Alexander the Great's talking about his giant lizard that frightened his army. Um, and there's all, all sorts of other accounts in history f as, as matter of fact accounts of great lizard-like beasts. And yet they're routinely discredited as not being true. You know, it is a misnomer that some of these dragon legends, or all the dragon legends, are just a product of opium-inspired pagan religions. I mean, that is not the case at all. What you have is you have actual historians. You have Herodotus. You have Jose, um, Flavius Josephus. You have Marco Polo that talk about dragons. Herodotus actually heard an account of flying reptiles, and he went and checked it out himself. And so, I mean, he showed the metal of a true historian. 400 years later or so, you have Flavius Josephus, a, an incredible Jewish historian, also talking about seemingly the same creature. You have this, this flying reptile. You have Marco Polo that, after his journey to China, uh, is describing a huge dragon. He calls it a dragon with this tail that is really dragging through the sand, leaving these marks. And um, we come to the point where we have to ask ourselves, are all these people just making this up? They're describing creatures that were not supposed to be alive then. According to evolutionary theory, that creatures like this were supposed to be separated by mankind for 65 to 70 million years. Yet, here we have respectable people writing in their history books, this is what I've seen, this is what I've witnessed. And they sound just like dinosaurs. Well, I think we should take the testimony of these very reliable historians. For the most part, I think that they were very candid in what they were writing about when it came to historical narrative. And if they were talking about these large, formidable creatures, I don't see why there's any reason to question that. If man and dinosaurs never lived together but were separated by millions of years, then we have to say all those ancients were mistaken. And I don't believe that we should accuse them of that because they were intelligent people like you and I. They built cities before the flood. We're told that they had musical instruments. They had tools of iron and brass. Now you think about that. Before the flood, they had metal tools. That implies they had to find the metals, they had to mine them, and they had to smelt them exactly like we do today. So. Let us not dare accuse ancient people of being unintelligent and untechnological. The Bible does use the term dragons over and over again. It talks about ocean dragons, it talks about flying dragons, it talks about land dragons. And you know, that seems to fit with these great reptilian beasts that include the dinosaurs. And it makes sense. If those things were so dominant on the planet before the flood and certainly right after the flood, they would have made it into the, 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 the history of the culture. In 1845, the, uh, a newspaper in um, the town of Geelong in Victoria published a sketch of a creature that the local Aboriginal people had described as a bunyip. A common Aboriginal term for monster, it's often thought of as mythical, but this Aboriginal had big, deep claw marks across his chest, and uh, the description he gave, presumably through an interpreter at the time, uh, was the basis of this sketch in the Geelong Advertiser and it looks very much like one of the, the duck-billed dinosaurs. In fact, some large bones were reported at that time that were fresh and were unlike any other creature that uh, people were familiar with at the time. And 13 years later, on the other side of the world, a uh, dinosaur was unearthed and uh, it was called Edmontosaurus, and when you look at a reconstruction of Edmontosaurus next to uh, the sketch of the Bunyip, drawn by um, the artist for the uh, newspaper in Geelong on the basis of Aboriginal descriptions, the two are very similar. You have to interpret evidence of the present in relation to the past. And what I would say is this, there is very strong circumstantial evidence because all evidence in relation to the past is like a forensic scientist, they're working with circumstantial evidence, is, is very strongly confirms the Bible's history that dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. With so many people hunting him, Danny had to hide. 
As he rumbled back toward the ocean, he passed a man with two daughters walking along the beach. Instead of running, they just stopped and stared in shock. Danny said, hello, how are you? Which sounded like a ferocious roar. <laughs> We think many of your dragon legends could actually be stories about what we today call dinosaurs. The reason why you don't find the word dinosaur in the Bible is the same reason why you don't find words like computer or locomotive, because all of those words were invented in the English language well after the um, Bible was translated into English. The word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841 by Sir Richard Owen, who was head of the British Museum. Before that, words such as dragon were used in the Bible. The King James Bible was first translated into English in 1611. So the word dinosaur is a modern word. There is a distinct philosophy that is uh, able to be identified when you look at the King James Version of the Bible that was first printed in 1611 to the more modern translations in English language uh, like the ESV. In 1611 they used the word dragon 35 times. Uh, in the Old Testament alone, they use the word, the plural word, dragon, 16 times. But if you look at the ESV today, they use the word dragons in the plural form, zero. And what is very clear to see is that whenever dragon is used to refer to a real living, living, breathing creature that walks upon land, the ESV has decided that that is not a word that can be used. Uh, most of the time, they replace it with jackal, which is like a little hairy dog. Um, now that is a big discrepancy between a small hairy fox-like creature and a big gigantic reptile-like creature. Uh, and what you see is that the evolutionary mindset has seeped into nearly to so many things that we have even our most conservative Bible theologians look at dragons. They do not make the connection between dragon and dinosaur and they have the idea that, wow, dragons aren't real, so we have to protect the inerrancy of the Bible. Most of the um, uh, people believe that dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, and therefore uh, humans couldn't possibly have seen them because they haven't been around that long. So it's a case of a faulty uh, view of history with this millions of years imposed upon it, uh, which means they have to try to explain away um, human encounters with um, creatures which we would call dragons. But sometimes we treat God like he's a little old lady that needs help crossing the street. You know, no, I believe that God said what he means, and he means what he said. So if dinosaurs and dragons really are one and the same, one might actually ask, well, why did dragons fade into mythology to begin with? And that's a really good question. So you had all cultures in the world essentially passing on stories about big lizards. And over time, those stories get corrupted, they get distorted. It's a fish story of the day, you know, they, they get this added or that added and all of a sudden they become magical and they cast spells in at least a modern fantasy literature. Um, it was not until around the year 1800 that a French scientist named Georges Cuvier started to publish his findings that the extinction of a species was actually possible. Um, before that time, no one thought that species could go extinct. They actually thought that God had a kind of a supernatural preservation on the, all the species of the world. Um, the reason they thought that was an errant view of the Bible. They go back to Genesis and said, you know, that God created the, um, all the creatures and that it was good. So they, they thought that at that point that there was kind of a, a supernatural preservation on that. That then got reinforced again when the flood came. And, and, and the story of Noah's flood is that God was going to cleanse the planet and was going to basically start over and with Noah and his family. Well, he had Noah bring all the animal kinds two by two to the ark. And again, there was this sense of preservation. We didn't invent the word dinosaur until the 1800s. And so anything before the 1800s could not have used the word dinosaur. And so no Bible translations would use the word dinosaur pr prior to the 1800s. And since then, no Bible translation would dare to use the word dinosaur because of the pressure from the evolutionists. So people before the 1800, as they're hearing the stories of dragons, they're looking around saying, I don't see that creature alive today. And if it is not alive today, then it was never alive. And that is how and why dragons fade into mythology. There are a lot of things that, that over the years have been found that were thought to have been extinct. Um, some mammals, some fishes, um, some plants. Uh, the coelacanth was, was the classic example uh, from the early 1900s. The Wollemi pine, which was discovered uh, in the later 1900s. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that pop up that no one thought should be, that no, everyone thought went extinct, 
but it turns out that they're still here and they're essentially unchanged from the way they were supposedly millions of years ago. And also there's an Australian um, living fossil that's very well known. It's called the Wallamite Pine and it was found in a very isolated part of a conservation reserve near Sydney in New South Wales and uh, it quickly became known as the dinosaur tree because they said it had lived alongside the dinosaurs and the initial dating of the Wallamide pine fossils was that it had been thought to be extinct for many millions of years. Now when they found this Wallamy pine just a short time ago, um, the curator of the uh, Sydney Botanical Gardens apparently said it's just like finding a live dinosaur. I think he said a live small dinosaur um, because the point is it has exactly the same significance. Now the coelacanth is a fish. Uh, fossils have been found of this fish that the evolutionists say um, died out say 70 million years ago. Uh, came on the scene about 400 million years ago. The reality is in 1938 off of the island of Madagascar fishermen started catching coelacanths. And so now the evolutionist is presented with a problem. If coelacanths died out 75 million years ago, what's a live one doing in 1938? And they found a lot more of them. Some are even in aquariums today. Here's an interesting thing. Years ago, when I was in undergraduate school in Minnesota, I was taking a course in botany. And our professor took us all outside the botany building to pay obeisance to a, uh, uh, a ginkgo tree. And we all stood around in just deep reverence looking at this ginkgo tree, because we were told that this ginkgo tree, uh, we can see it in the fossil record back to the time of the dinosaurs and beyond, and here it is growing alive and well just outside of our botany building, and isn't that amazing? And boy, we were impressed, but you know, now that I look back on that, why didn't our prof just show us the far more abundant oak trees and elm trees? Because they're in the fossil record too. We have acorns, we have walnuts, and these are dating back 40, 50 million years. No, I don't accept these dates. I believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, but uh, if you're going to accept these dates, uh, we have a tank here in the Creation Museum that is full of native Kentucky aquatic creatures. Sunfish, which have been found, the good old sunny you fish for, you know, if you like to fish. Uh, they were around back according to the fossil record 40, 50 million years ago. Uh, garfish go back at least as far as the dinosaurs. We have the short-nosed gar in the tank. Turtles, uh, 120 million years. Uh, bats, 60 million years, 50 million years. And they look just like the bats do today. Amber is what I call a time capsule. It uh, is some, some amber is supposed to be up to 50 million years old and uh, quite a bit of amber has what are called inclusions in it. Now inclusions can be uh, insects, they could be uh, water, uh, actually uh, they could be uh, oxygen or air bubbles if you will. And uh, the reason I call amber a time capsule is lo and behold when we find for example um, ants and termites uh, we've even found uh, the pine bark beetle that is decimating the forests in the Rocky Mountain West. These animals, or these insects, if you will, are exactly the same as what we have today. The Jurassic shrimp was supposed to become extinct during the Jurassic time, and yet they're alive and well and just as delicious today as back in the uh, alleged evolutionary past. And so these uh, living fossils, I think, are clear testimony to the youth of this Earth. Terrified, the man pushed his daughters behind him and said, Oh God, you are wonderful and powerful and created such amazing creatures. Please don't let him eat my daughters. As you love all your creation, I love them. Then he turned and plunged back into the ocean. According to conventional wisdom, the dinosaurs lived from about uh, 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. The reason not why they say that is after the so-called Cretaceous layers, you don't find any more dinosaur fossils above there. And so they believe the dinosaurs were wiped out 65 million years ago. And they believe that man only evolved in the last two million years, say, because we only find human fossils at the very top of the layers. And so man and dinosaurs, in their view, could never have lived together. 
because they would be separated by over 60 million years. An evolutionist would look at the fossil record and they would, based on their, their idea that the earth is ancient and that the present is the key to the past, and they would look at natural processes which act very slowly, they would say, therefore, the fossil record must have accumulated very slowly. And because it's such a slow process, it's actually, a, a, you can look at it and look at different eras of time. And so in, in this section, these fossils are buried. That means that these fossils are alive at one point in time. And then a, if there's a layer that appears above that, well, that must be a later period of time. There's a different set of fossils being buried there. That's a snapshot of a different period of time. And then they build this very elaborate tree structure of all of life, and they build this very elaborate uh, model of of the geologic record. Well, basically what they do is look at the sedimentary rock units in the Jurassic layer and they find some dinosaurs there and they say because we find dinosaurs here, this particular layer is at least 70, 75 million years old. And so it is a tautology where they date the fossils by the rock layers and they, they date the rock layers by the fossils that they find in them. And so it is a, a cause for circuitous or circular reasoning. I did one year of geology in the, uh, my university and it's interesting that the head of the department uh, said um, the fossil record does not support Darwinian evolution. He said this plainly. He made it clear he was not a creationist but he did say the fossil record seems support, to support a series of divine creations. This I heard from the professor of geology and professor in New, in New Zealand was the high highest rank of, of uh, university teachers, not just any old lecturer. Well, fossils are formed only under special circumstances. Um, I've, I, I'm a marine biologist, I'm a scuba diver. I've, oh, I lost count after about 500 scuba dives. And it's funny because most people think marine biologists study whales and dolphins, but really most marine biologists study worms and bacteria and mud. And so in my, my life, I've studied a lot of mud. I've, I've, dug mud in lakes, rivers, and streams all over the southeast. Um, all, all looked at the sediments all up and down the Florida Keys, over in the Bahamas, in, in Belize, uh, one, one trip to the South Pacific, which was very nice. And all that digging and all that sand and all that dirt and all that mud, I've never found a fish skeleton. I've never found an incipient fossil. I've never seen, found something that was being fossilized. Because fish, when they die, if, when they finally do hit the bottom, they're eaten by everything. And usually, um, they're eaten on the way down. And so their, their bones tend to be scattered all over the place and, and their flesh is, is destroyed. And even if they land in the mud, the bones dissolve over time in the water made of calcium carbonate is soluble in seawater. Uh, it, it, it really, it takes special circumstances to make a fossil. And most of those circumstances are met by Noah's flood, where you have a very rapid amount of sedimentation. We have lots of fossils being buried very quickly being sealed off away from oxygen and then be impregnated by the minerals that dissolved in the water that can recrystallize inside those bones, prevent them from dissolving away, and you get a, a fossil. So I believe those dinosaurs were uh, uh, buried in sediment at the time of Noah's flood, which would have been about 4,000 years ago. So either at the time of the flood or at some point after the flood, during the runoff, because all the dinosaurs that we know of, with rare exception, are buried in water-deposited sediment. As Ken Ham says, if there really was a worldwide flood, you'd expect to see billions of things buried in rock layers deposited by water all over the earth. And what you really see are billions of dead things buried in rock layers deposited by water all over the earth. And that is certainly true of the dinosaurs. And when you read about them, they always are, are described as having wandered too close to an inland sea or lake, and maybe got a little tipsy and fell in. And before their flesh could rot, before scavengers could eat, uh, they became encased in a very cementitious rock. This isn't going on today. I have rabbits and squirrels in my backyard. I don't know what happens to them when they die. I've never seen any little rabbit funerals or anything like that. And I'll tell you, they're certainly not making fossils. You can't get a fossil if you, a dinosaur died uh, in the, the forest, it's going to uh, rot away and get scavenged. And you can see that in the farms today, you don't see uh, sheep and cattle fossilized. You have to bury them quickly and when you have something uh, like the, a global flood, you're going to bury lots of creatures and that's why we find um, lots of fossil dinosaur graveyards where they've been washed in like, the Iguanodon graveyard. It makes sense if you've got a huge catastrophe, uh, a watery catastrophe. And of course, when you have a watery catastrophe, you don't need millions of years to explain the rock layers either. Right behind me is what is called a polystrate fossil. 
poly meaning many, straight meaning strata. So here's a fossil that is straight up and down going through many layers of strata. And what is significant about that? Well, first off, the conventional wisdom around here in uh, the Hell Creek Formation is that it could take a thousand years uh, a centimeter to lay down all of the uh, uh, sedimentary deposits. Well, is that uh, polystrate fossil behind me going to wait around for a hundred thousand years while slowly all of the uh, sediment is uh, put in around it to hold it straight up? No. It's going to decompose, it's going to fall over long before that happened. It had to have been done very, very quickly. There are some fish fossils that I've seen with exquisite preservation. All the scales, all the fins are intact. The, the fish's mouth is closed. His gills are closed, which is indication that he's buried in squish. In fact, the, the streamlines around the fish and the mud, it looks like he was struggling and trying to swim as he's being buried. We've got abundant evidence of rapid fossilization. There's some three-dimensional dinosaurs that are preserved where a dinosaur is crouching down and yet he's covered in mud and the only way to do that is if the mud is accumulating so quickly that he's literally suffocated in the mud because if he had died he would have fallen over or at least would have laid down flat but no he's crouching the mud covers all the way up above his head and Mount St. Helens is certainly an excellent example because we saw things happen there that blew geologists mind. Uh, May 1980 the eruption of Mount St. Helens and the next uh, you know in, in that major eruption and subsequent ones, up to 600 feet of rock layers, new material was deposited around Mount St. Helens. And at one particular level, we find a 20-foot horizon that was produced on June 12, 1980. We, we know the day and the year because people were there to observe it. So it's testable, you know, we've got, we've got reliable eyewitness accounts. But within that 20-foot thick layer, we have multiplicity of small layers, alternating coarse and fine banded, coarse and fine grained layers. Now a geologist normally looking at that with a millions of years belief system, we call it mental glasses, looking through the idea of millions of years, who would have thought that each of those little bands would have taken thousands of years to accumulate, or you know, alternating yearly, yearly sequences and so, the whole sequence, hundreds of them, would have taken hundreds of years. But we observed it to happen in just one day. The rock layers are not a sequence of age, but a sequence of burial. Taking their age interpretation, they shouldn't be, the sea the cancer died out. Yet we know they're living today. People will ask, why are there no dinosaur and humans fossilized together? I would ask, why are there no sea lecanths and whales fossil together, even though they live in the sea together? It's because they just weren't buried together. Now, how do you explain that by slow and gradual processes with little local floods over millions of years? Now, only a global flood can explain rock layers with marine fossils up on the continents that were catastrophically deposited and buried that swept right across the continents and, and between continents. I mean, the evidence is crying out for catastrophe. It screams Noah's flood, it therefore screams a young Earth. You know, radiometric dating is seen as the linchpin of, of the evolutionary age of the Earth. They say, oh, all these radiometric dating techniques show the Earth is ancient, so how can you believe in a young Earth? Well, actually, what I do is I, I appeal to known lava flows. Go to Hawaii, sample a lava flow, sample some basalt that's come out of the Earth, bring it back to your laboratory, tell me what age you measure. It's not going to be zero. It's not going to be even a few thousand years old. You're going to get an old age. Uh, it doesn't matter what technique you use. So what that does is that takes the idea that you can measure the difference between the daughter product and the parent product and calculate an age as if there was a clock. That discredits anything that, that's using the assumption that there's zero daughter products. Well, I was involved in a project called the RATE project, R-A-T-E. It stands for Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth. It was an acronym that we put together to describe so people could quickly identify uh, what this project was. And, and it was a conducted uh, between 1997 and 2005 and we got some exciting e evidences that confirmed that the conclusion we came to was that the nuclear decay rates, radioactive decay rates, had been grossly accelerated at some time or times in the past. At some event the decay rates had been accelerated, that had been speeded up to such an enormous extent that you could essentially have hundreds of millions of years worth of nuclear decay measured by the rates at which they occur today, all of that happening 
within a few thousand years. So one of the best examples we came up with, well, there, there are several good ones. There were tiny crystals found in a granite in New Mexico from a drill hole. And uh, essentially, when uranium decays to lead, the parent decays to the, Lord, to the daughter lead, the byproduct is helium. And helium gas is it, it's not che it's chemically stable. It, it doesn't re react with other elements. It's an, what we call an inert element or inert gas. And because it's only got small atoms, it could leak very easily out of those crystals. But we found that the uranium lead date for these crystals, suppose, you know, with the millions of years scenario, using the radioisotope dating, was one and a half billion years. But most of the helium that would have been produced by that amount of nuclear decay was still in the crystals. So we, we made predictions. Then we sent the crystals to a well-recognized laboratory who, who was well known for doing that work to actually measure the rate of leakage. And what, where did it fit? Exactly on the 6,000 year prediction. In other words, while the uranium to lead clock had ticked at the rate of 1.5 billion years, that's 1,500 million years, while uranium had been ticking through that rate, Helium had been leaking at a different rate. That means because we know of the law of leakage of these atoms, well-known physical law that we can reproduce in the laboratory, that was a far more credible age determination method. There was a, some basalt flows that, that erupted uh, on the rim of the Grand Canyon, flowed down into the canyon all the way to the base of the canyon. That means that the, the lava flow is younger than the canyon younger than the, the uppermost sediments and yet that lava flow dates to millions of years older than the canyon itself it really raises the question how do we know that these techniques are valid we've got other lines of evidence there was about three or four lines of evidence that we found that all pointed in the same direction that the assumption of nuclear decay rates always being constant at the rates we measure today isn't true that they were accelerated in the past, and that means the clocks can't be trusted. We have done carbon-14 dating on coal and diamonds, which are hugely old. Diamonds are supposed to be over a billion years old, and yet we find carbon-14 in them. Now, hang on, carbon-14 would have long just decayed if they were that old. One of the uh, discoveries that has really rocked the evolutionary world was made by Dr. Mary Schweitzer and Dr. Jack Horner. Uh, from analyzing the uh, interior, uh, the bone marrow, if you will, uh, of the thigh bone or the femur of a T-Rex that was excavated back in 2003. Their report was published in the March-April uh, 2005 edition of Science Magazine, a very prestigious peer-reviewed science magazine. And they reported, and to my left, our pictures, uh, just a few pictures, there's many more that were actually in the magazine, they reported soft, stretchable, elastic, snapback like a rubber band tissue in that thigh bone. In addition, they reported finding red blood vessels, uh, blood vessels that still had blood cells in them that were identifiable, and all of that would be impossible if this dinosaur died out 65 to 68 million years ago. Clearly, Science has shown this dinosaur died out very recently, and I would say perhaps as a result of the flood of Noah's day, just a matter of, say, 4,000 years ago. Doctors Mary Schweitzer and Jack Horner are paleontologists. They study fossils. Specifically, they're interested in dinosaurs. In fact, I think you could call Jack Horner Mr. Dinosaur. I mean, he's probably associated with the study of dinosaurs as much or more than anyone else that comes to mind. Mary Schweitzer said that on one such test she said she couldn't believe it until she'd done it 17 times. This is pretty thorough. So most people are, are understandably shocked, and that includes certainly evolutionists, uh, that you should find what appears to be fresh marrow. Still soft, still with blood vessels, still with red blood cells. More recently, they've gone beyond that. Schweitzer, working with other investigators, have looked at the biochemistry of the marrow, and they have indeed found protein fragments. Now, not the whole protein, but protein fragments. Proteins usually don't remain completely undisturbed for uh, a few thousand years, and of course we have no idea for 70 million 
Well, of course, the evolutionary naturalists who adhere, who embrace the long ages of evolution, who maintain adamantly that man and dinosaur are separate by 65 million years, are very, very uncomfortable with these continuing discoveries of Murray Schweitzer. Tom Kay of Seattle, who was also a critic of the first study of Murray Schweitzer, said, and I quote, this will either be nothing or the biggest revolution in paleontology ever. You know, I would have to agree with the, f the latter portion of his quote. This is one of the greatest paleontological discovers, uh, discoveries ever. Danny returned to his cave, deep in thought. What had made that man on the beach so brave? The man had spoken about someone who had created him. The man had spoken about a creator that loved all his creatures. Was Danny one of those creatures? Most of your dinosaur books, if you go to Barnes and Noble or wherever, uh, they're all millions of years, millions of years, millions of years. Kids have been to see those movies uh, that uh, talk about dinosaurs. They might be fictional movies uh, like Jurassic Park and so on, but at the same time, they still teach millions of years. Ever since Darwin and Lyell, that this idea of many, many millions of years is a philosophical necessity, but is certainly not found in science. The main movers and shakers at the time were really striving to discredit the Bible. I mean, Lyell himself said that his stated goal was to free the world from Moses. And if that's a stated goal to free the world from Moses, he is actively trying to undermine the biblical account, biblical account of creation. So that's why we have to talk about the age of the earth issue if we want to talk about dinosaurs and humans, because these are two radically different views. And if the earth is young, then dinosaurs and man did live together and the dinosaur, the dragon legends are believable. Paleontologists uh, also, I believe, go ahead and uh, fill in the gaps as they see them in the evolutionary timeline, going from monkeys to man, going from uh, microbes to man. One of the things that they find, though, in the process of doing that is that life is very complex whether it's dead life or living life it is still extremely complex and so that means they've got to have huge amounts of time in order to give people any idea at all that um, it's credible to go from microbes to man and that's really time is the magic bullet for the evolutionist it's a lot of time which makes the impossible possible old earth uh old universe even, but certainly old Earth, 4.5 billion years, is important to the evolutionist uh, because they need a great deal of time for things to evolve by the evolutionary process, which would involve random changes due to mutations uh, and natural selection. I would suggest it requires infinitely more time than the pittance of 4.5 billion years. I encourage them to think along the lines of Google years. That would be to the Google power. I mean, you need years that make billions look like nothing if you're going to try to attribute to chance uh, even a single biologically useful protein. Well, they say that over billions of years anything is possible, but would you ever expect someone to win the lottery every single day for 10 years straight? That's essentially the, the odds that they're claiming anything is possible. If that happened, a court of law would call that guy guilty, send him to jail for the rest of his life because he's cheating. Even if they don't know how he's cheating, they would have to conclude that you are cheating because this is impossible. So their, their idea that anything is possible is really ridiculous on the, face of, on the face of it. Would require more time and material than is in the known universe to have ever evolved by chance. Uh, once you can buy all that and accept it, once you can accept photosynthesis having formed by chance, I don't see a hill of beans difference between believing it happened by chance in 6,000 years versus 6 billion years. I mean, one's just as improbable as the other. We've reached a point where the p-values are so low that what's the difference? But evolutionists know that their arguments would be even less tenable to laymen if the times were shortened too much for them. We say humans are very complicated and, and a sponge or a jellyfish would be very non-complicated. Uh, but it's really funny because a, a jellyfish, or at least the, the sea anemone, has got about the same number of protein-coding genes as people. So in all these billions of years of supposed evolution, we actually haven't increased the number of genes hardly at all. 
And a lot of the genes that they have that we thought at first was, was something specific to vertebrates or specific to higher life forms, they have them also. So the evolution is scratching their head. The simplest cell is utterly complex. The simplest life out there is so mind-bogglingly complex that it's, 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 to me, it's impossible to conceive that it just spontaneously evolved from random chemicals. There, there is an unbridgeable gap between the simplest cell and random chemistry. It's sort of like saying, um, oh, well, we can find, if you go out in nature, you can find a rock sitting on top of another rock just from natural processes, you know, maybe fell off the cliff and landed on top of another rock. And because you can find rocks sitting on top of rocks, that explains the Great Pyramids. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, we have decay. We have the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, I look in the mirror every day, and it's hitting me with a vengeance. Uh, yeah, we've been told that if our theories ever run counter to the second law, we can be pretty sure they're not right. Uh, the second law basically tells us that at least a uh, closed system, everything goes downhill. Uh, things fall apart. They don't spontaneously self-assemble over the long haul. The evolutionist tries to get out of this by arguing that the Earth is an open system, that energy keeps impacting on the Earth from the sun, and that this energy sort of drives the uh, evolution uphill and causes entropy then to decrease rather than increase. This is really not a good argument. We know that energy is necessary for the assembly of complex things. That's true in an automobile plant. Without energy, the plant comes to a halt. But uh, energy by itself is a necessary but not sufficient condition of, say, making automobiles. One needs information, you need programs, you need sequences. Things have to be done in a certain order. Parts have to arrive at a certain time, have to fit other parts. There's an integration of complexity. Energy alone is not sufficient to explain it. The Achilles heel in evolutionary theory is a lack of transitional species. There should be millions of transitional species. There should be tremendous numbers of transitional species between the major groups of animals, but there aren't. In fact, you've got the Cambrian explosion where all the major phyla of life, the biggest differences that exist, they just poof, appear out of nowhere with no transitional species. You've got, um, you know, Darwin saying that he's, he's leaving up to future generations of geologists to, to discover all the innumerable transitional species that must exist. But since the 1960s, the fossil records changed by about 4%. So what they have is a handful of disputable transitional species. Uh, those transitional species they use today were not the ones they used in the 1970s. It's not the ones they used at the 1925 Scopes trial. It's not the ones that Charles Darwin had in his, in his day. Each transitional species seems to have a shelf life of maybe 10 years. And then it's kind of quietly shuffled off to the side and they think of something else and something else is brought up as a transitional species. I mean, you had the, the famous evolution of the horse series. Everyone remembers that, the little horse or the big horse. That's not found in, in, the, in the textbooks anymore, and if it is, it shouldn't be, because that's been routinely and soundly discredited. And a lot of the other things that, that people would remember as the best evidence for evolution uh, really turned out to be no evidence at all. Charles Darwin did the same thing when he thought up his idea of evolution. He saw that the facts of the fossil record did not line up with his theory, and so he made a very unscientific decision. He decided to hold on to his theory and ignore the facts. The same thing happened in the 21st century. Mary Schweitzer said in Discover Magazine, April of 2006, quote, I had one reviewer tell me he didn't care what the data said. He knew that what I was finding wasn't possible. I wrote back and said, well, what data would convince you? And he said, none, end quote. And so here's a perfect example of where people are saying, I have my unproved theory of evolution that spans many, many millions of years where there's no creator, no designer, it's just time, chance, and natural processes, but the facts don't line up with it. I'd rather hold on to the, uh, the uh, theory than the facts. Many of the opponents of young earth creationism point to young earth creationists as being the enemies of science, that they don't think rationally and they actually stop good science being done. In fact, when you look at the uh, really great breakthroughs of science in recent decades, very often you'll find those who made those breakthroughs were uh, Christians and uh, certainly understood the God of creation. I mean, who can we name uh, bigger, more influential than Isaac Newton? He was a Bible-believing Christian, Pasteur, Kepler. I mean. 
We're not just talking about mere Nobel Prize winners. We're talking about people that opened up whole areas of science. Boyle, Maxwell, Faraday, George Washington Carver, Louis Pasteur, all of these men of science who are also men of God, who believe that in the beginning, God created. So many people think it's the religion versus science. No, it's, it's the science built on one religion versus the science built on a different religion. And see, I start with a belief that God's word is true, that we have reliable eyewitness accounts of what happened in the past, therefore I build my science on that. Whereas an evolutionist has a belief in millions of years with no God, just everything happening slowly and gradually, and now he builds his science on that. What, what most people have to decide which view is correct. The search continued for Danny, and the tracks he had made were easy to follow. Soon the authorities were searching the water and Danny had to leave his cave and dive deeper and deeper. Somehow though, despite not finding a friend, he didn't feel as alone as before. Someone out there must have loved him. Enough to make him, he may be different, but he was loved. I think that a dinosaur is described in detail more than most other animals in the Bible. I really do. For instance, when you go to Job 40, there we have an account of God speaking with a man called Job, and this was after the flood. And he was saying to Job, look at this animal called Behemoth. Now that's just not an English word, that's just a transliteration of a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word there is plural, because Behemoth is a well-known word for a beast. So Behemoth is saying it's the beast of beasts, and God said to Job, behold this. So he was expecting Job to understand what, was being, what he was talking about, and what I made along with you. So it implies that it was made along, on, alongside mankind, and um, then it says, so it's a beast of beasts made along with mankind. Everything about it is big. His legs are big, his, his bones are strong like brass and iron. He's an enormous creature, chief of the ways of God. Some Hebrew experts say that means it was the largest land animal God made. And you know, the largest land animal we know of today from the fossil record are some of your dinosaurs like your sauropods, like a seismosaurus or something. And then it has a tail like a cedar. Well, you think of the cedars of Lebanon. I mean, a tail like a cedar, that'd be an enormous tail. You know, many Bible commentaries, for instance, the NIV study Bible in the notes actually says this was a hippopotamus uh, or an elephant. But a hippopotamus tail is like a little flap of skin. And, you know, a, a, an elephant's tail is like a piece of rope hanging in the wind. It's really difficult to know why uh, many commentators, even conservative commentators, are unwilling to take the descriptions in the book of Job about this, this creature and to try to apply them to a hippopotamus or some other animal when the description doesn't fit. Uh, I suppose only they themselves know their motives and, and the Lord. Uh, is it that they're afraid of looking foolish or you know, scientifically simplistic or, or whatever, but, but it is very clear that the description of the, the animal there in Job's uh, book is not a hippopotamus. When we look at the, the description of that creature, it really does seem to fit with a, a brachiosaur or a parasaurus, sauropod type dinosaur. You read the description of Behemoth while looking at a fossil at, say, the Pittsburgh uh, Carnegie Mellon Museum of Natural History, and limbs like great bars of iron, you know. That's exactly the way it looks doesn't mean the bones were made out of iron, it means they were just like great big bronze tubes and uh, iron tubes and uh, these big ribs, this immense belly, this big tail. I mean, we're clearly not describing a pussycat. Uh, this fits uh, a dinosaur. Well, you know, Leviathan in Job 41 was not a dinosaur because technically the word dinosaur only refers to land animals. So we could say a dinosaur-like creature, if you like, that lived in the sea. The Bible describes it as a dragon that lives in the sea. This thing is about the size of a school bus and weighed eight tons. And just as Leviathan is described as leaving a trail in the mud with, you know, pot sherds, like, like shattered pieces of pottery, that's the sort of trail that a crocodile makes in the mud. But you're not talking about the crocodile that we know nowadays. If you look at this picture of a modern-day crocodile skull, and uh, this Sarcosuchus skull around it, you can see the vast difference in size. 
and it truly fits the description in the book of Job where it talks about how you know this sort of creature will just shrug off harpoons and arrows and 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 laugh at fish hooks and things like this and also uh, the book of Job describes as if it has rows of shields closely interlocking with no space between them and it's interesting that the um, a description of Sarcosuchus includes the many scoots that have been found and these are like the big scales and they are closely overlocking and they're about one foot in diameter these shields on uh, Leviathan. It says that he breathed fire. Now when people look at that they say well now we know the Bible can't be trusted because that's just a mythical creature breathing fire. I say whoa whoa wait a minute wait a minute who says animals can't breathe fire? I mean think about it we have a little beetle called the bombardier beetle that can mix chemicals like hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide together and blast out hot gases at 212 degrees Fahrenheit to put a frog off its lunch. You look at uh, the electric eel the ability to electrocute. You look at the spitting coma that uses a huge gust of air from its lungs to really create an aerosol type effect for its venom that shoots out and will hit the eyes of, of uh, you know attackers or, or enemies. You start looking at some of these things and you're like okay can is it possible that these eyewitness accounts really did have some evidence behind them. Interestingly the uh, snout of Sarcosuchus had a buller, some sort of a hollow cavity of some sort at the tip that nobody knows exactly what it was for. Could that have been for mixing of chemicals or some sort of a chamber, uh, some sort of a chemical storage chamber for generating the, the fire and smoke that the um, uh, Book of Job also describes concerning Leviathan? We have the eyewitness testimony of these dragons in the world after the flood which fits them being on the ark with Noah. When we're talking about dinosaurs and talking about dinosaurs as um, being on the ark of Noah, boy, immediately uh, some people that uh, don't believe that, their, their antenna goes up. They say, oh, dinosaurs are too big. They couldn't have fit on the ark. But let's think about this for a second. First off, what's the average size of a dinosaur? The average size of a dinosaur is like a sheep or a goat. It's not like a big, huge T-Rex or a big, long neck uh, Apatosaurus or something like that. But then let's look at the long neck dinosaur or the T-Rex or any of the others of that size. The main thing that God wanted to do was to have two of these creatures on the ark so that, that when the flood was over and they left, they could reproduce after their kind. And so uh, God would want to send younger ones. And uh, science today believes that dinosaurs could reproduce at about age eight to 10. So younger, smaller, uh, the ark was big, 450 feet long, and there would have been plenty of room for two of every kind of dinosaur along with all the other animals that God wanted. Why would they become extinct after the flood? Well, because the climate was changed after the flood. It was a much more harsh and climate with a different topography. And second, they would have competed with man for food and, and places. A lot of things have become extinct. Um, things become extinct by chance. I mean, a lot of them would have been wiped out during the flood, which is why we have the fossils and the survivors, which the Bible says were on the Ark of Noah, a gigantic ocean liner-sized boat. They could have been hunted by man, which is why you have dragon legends of hunting dragons. And the Ice Age, which almost certainly happened just after the flood, would have not have been good for large reptiles. Danny found a deep valley at the bottom of the ocean floor and dove down into it. It was murky and hard to see. He thought no one would ever find him here until he noticed two very large eyes peering at him. Out of the dark waters came another creature. To anyone else, she looked enormous and scary. But to Danny, she was gorgeous. He said, I'm Danny, who are you? Which sounded like, roar! <laughs> but instead of swimming away, she roared back. I'm Lucy. I thought I was all alone. Danny smiled. Not anymore. Never again. And deep in the cold and dark at the bottom of the ocean, the two dragons swam off to live happily ever after. The end. <laughs> if it could be shown that dinosaurs were 4,000 years old, it would not be the end of evolution. Nothing will be the end of evolution except the return of Jesus Christ. Man simply cannot tolerate 
a creator because a natural man, apart from having come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, we can't tolerate a creator because it involves accountability. And so we have to explain how we could come into existence spontaneously without a creator, without a designer, without a builder, how nature left to itself, matter, energy, time, and space, that must suffice. In fact, it's the whole philosophy of science nowadays. Scientists are, are no more objective than anyone else, and there's a worldview thing. Because if the flood account is true, it means that uh, God has judged sin, which means we're accountable to him, and that is unwelcome for a lot of people. It's not surprising to me at all that we are finding evidence of man and dinosaurs together, because if you take the creation account literally, then it says on the sixth day would have been the day that God created all of these animals and uh, man also. Therefore, they were concurrent. They, the, the dinosaurs didn't precede man by one million or 65 million years. They were on this earth together. Once you look at the soft tissue, combined with the evidence for man and dinosaurs or dragons having interacted, boy, it all fits together. The evidence itself really fits together. The dogma of millions of years isn't borne out by the evidence. Rather, the evidence is forcibly smashed into that dogma. Evolutionary theory is driven by the paradigm and not by the evidence. A lot of people, when they uh, think of creationists uh, who have science degrees, and they wonder, how can they believe in creation? Uh, what they don't realise is that creation is the is a logical way of looking at the world we have today in light of historical account of the Bible. It all makes sense. Like makes a lot more sense than from an uh, evolutionary perspective. The reason why we have the Appalachian Mountains and the Himalayas is because of the flood and all the upheavals that occurred in the flood. Why do we have dead billions of dead things buried in rock lies laid down by water over the earth? because the Bible says all the high hills under the whole of the heaven were covered with water and all the animals were swept away and the water would pick up sand and mum that would bury billions of dead things buried in rock lows laid down by water all over the earth. And so I, I hold to the view that the Bible explains, tells us what happened in the past, we can test that and we find the overwhelmingly the evidence supports that. I had actually, uh, I guess, really felt that I was reading something special because I could tell God how he did it. I had put God in a box and I'd say, yeah, God, you started out, but this is exactly how you did it. You used evolution. Now, I just, when that was pointed out to me, it hit me right between the eyes. Boy, how arrogant. And then he started pointing out the evidence, much of the evidence uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, today. And this evidence is just stacking up, proving that the Bible is true. Yeah! Hi, I thought this was a public library. It is. Is there something I can help you with? Yeah, the story was a little preachy. Who decides what to read? I'm sorry you feel that way. I actually chose the story. I thought it was nice. Not everyone believes there's a God. I liked it. Thank you. It's your sweetheart. But let's look for some other books, too. What's the point? I mean, why do you care how old this rock is, how old this fossil, how that animal got to be the way it is? But there are underlying meanings that go to the very core of our being, that answer life's big questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's the meaning to life? What happens after I die? These big questions are answered by creation information. Today, I find that the biggest objection people say as to why they can't accept Jesus is because they've been taught evolution at school of the millions of years and they say why should I trust the bits of the Bible that talk about Jesus when you can't trust the very first bits that talk about creation? Well I was an atheist all the way through university uh, because I believed that everything made itself because I believed in the millions of years and so on and, and it was obvious that the history and the Bible um, that the gospel depended upon that that if evolution and millions of years were right what the Bible was teaching just didn't make sense. It was only when somebody gave me a book that explained how I could look at the same facts and interpret them logically and rationally in a way that was not only intellectually satisfying but that fitted the Bible and that actually made more sense than the evolutionary long ages point of view that I could become a Christian. Today's scientific geological discoveries are confirming that 
processes that used to be thought to take literally hundreds of thousands or millions of years can be done very quickly, which supports the sudden creation, it supports the flood of Noah's day, and is adding additional support to the true history of the Bible. Your knowledge about the Creator it is testified by the creation itself. The creation is, the scripture says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The, 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 whether you're talking about astronomy or microscopy, the, uh, the frontiers of science bear testimony to design. And that design is sufficient to hold us accountable. The Bible is very clear that, that God is omniscient. He knows all. And if you accept that scripture is the word of God, uh, then he has given us a perfect record that we can base our lives on, base our views on. And therefore, uh, because man's views are always changing, uh, man's opinions have shifted down through the decades, centuries, uh, even just from an experiential standpoint, it makes sense that we would rest our hope, our faith, our views on God's wisdom and not man's wisdom. You see, a, a, a court in a courtroom, a judge and jury are going to look for eyewitnesses, aren't they? If they want to re-establish what happened in the past at the scene of the crime, they can have all the forensic evidence they like, but the forensic scientists weren't there. They're interpreting what the blood stains might mean and what this, you know, the, the gunpowder and the angle and all the rest of it, but they could be wrong. The judge and jury will determine the case from an eyewitness that was there who could describe exactly where the person was standing with the gun exactly what happened when the gun was, was fired. You see, that's what we have with the Bible. The Bible is telling us who was holding the gun, who was firing it, what happened. The scientists weren't there. The Bible stands on its own, but from science, we can really establish that it's true. We can find confirmation of it. We can find the evidence that it really did happen just that way. And so when I go and test that, I see there is evidence in God's world that supports God's work. The point is the creator himself who did all this entered his creation and fulfilled a mission that we were unable to fulfill for ourselves. And he did it on our behalf. That's the staggering discovery that awaits the person who's seriously interested in trying to find out what it's all about. The science we present is in order to remove stumbling blocks from people listening to the gospel message. We're not saved because we believe in Genesis 1-1, we're saved because we believe in Jesus Christ. It's by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Think about how contrary evolution is to Christianity. Uh, evolution is this idea of, of survival of the fittest, which really means extinction of the unfit. The vast majority of everything goes extinct. Um, and yet, how does Christianity approach things? The very kernel nut of Christianity is that not the survival of the fittest, but that the most fit of all, Jesus Christ, died for the unfit, so that the unfit could survive. That's me and you. Jesus entered the human race, even though he was creator, he entered creation, and he came as a man, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death on the cross for our sins, so that we could be redeemed, and a person who acknowledges his or her sin and is willing to humble themselves before God, repent of their sin, and receive Jesus Christ by faith is what the Bible refers to as being born again. That person is given new life, whereas they were dead in their sin. Now they have new life that comes from a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ.